Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today in this webinar on online tools for multi-stakeholder collaboration at the national and regional level, opportunities and challenges. This is Pierre Andrea here, I'm calling in from Malaysia and I'm going to facilitate this webinar together with Diana who is back at CTA headquarters in the Netherlands. Uh, we have some participants that are already online and we're expecting a few more, uh, but I think we should just uh, um, get started with the live session. And yes, we are recording this for rated playback and for people that could not join us. So, um, we have three main objectives for uh, this uh, session today, uh, and the first one um, is to uh, provide a quick overview about the support role that the Innov for Ag Pacific online platform has in building consensus for the validation of the national and regional action plans. Secondly, and that's the, 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 the big, biggest chunk of the, this webinar, uh, we want to showcase Tonga's achievement, uh, achievements as well as understand and learn how Tonga's stakeholders are making use of the online groups uh, and online platform to complement the face-to-face -face workshops and support collaboration during the validation of the National Action Plan. And thirdly, if we have time, uh, we want to identify some of the key elements uh, that uh, uh, we think are necessary to build successful communities and online collaborations in the region to support uh, this uh, work, to bring this work uh, um, further. This is the outline of the webinar. Um, of course, as I said, the main part is our celebrity interview. Uh, with uh, John Burke, uh, who will tell us about the Tonga case, how they've been working to validate the national election plan, and the use they've been making of the online platform. Um, if time allows, we'll have also a small group exercise to reflect together and identify key collective learning. Uh, we'll have Q&A at a certain point, but uh, um, throughout uh, we can use the chat to um, uh, comment, ask question, or share ideas and opinions. As I said at the beginning, this webinar is being recorded, so just be aware of it. We'll make it available um, for the larger group uh, of stakeholders involved in the project um, in, the next, uh, in the next few hours or in the coming days, after we've just done some slight editing. We think a program that we put together, it's interesting, but we really encourage participants to uh, join in. So type uh, uh, questions in the chat and typos don't count. Please engage in the polls. And then if we have time, we would like to hear also from you. We'll try to open the mic um, at a certain point. So the first part uh, of this session, uh, we would like to just bring everybody um, up to speed and make sure that everybody is on the same page in terms of the platform and its role in the larger project. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about the platform? Well, it's uh, a set of tools uh, uh, that we think are useful to coordinate uh, actions between different actors, to communicate uh, and uh, talk to get to each other, to connect people, and eventually to create content and co-create, uh, um, share learning uh, around the issues and in the region and for the different countries. Um, the first uh, and uh, the home and the, the, the home of the platform is the website, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, in uh, uh, .pips .fj. Uh This is the, the home of the, uh, of the platform. And what can you find? on this space. Uh, we have a quite rich set of uh, um, content in terms of news and updates. It's more than 100 content items, uh, more than 40 or 50 resources, documents, reports, uh, uh, studies, uh, um, and, and so on, uh, events uh, related to value chain development, agriculture in the region. The website is also the place to access the various online groups that have been set up as part of the project. We'll zoom in into this uh, a bit later on, but uh, just that you know, and this is just a reminder, this, this is how you get 
you enter this, uh, you can join and enter this uh, uh, online groups that are created through the uh, main uh, through the through the website, the main website. Recently, we have been adding uh, some new features uh, on the, the website, uh, one being a funding opportunity database. This came as a request from uh, uh, various uh, uh, participants and stakeholders in the project to have a space where they could easily find and share opportunities for funding um, that are accessible to actors in the region. So we put this together. There are probably about uh, more than uh, 40 different opportunities at this moment uh, um, uh, that are uh, available that are linked in the, plat in, in the database and we encourage, of course, um, anybody that comes across uh, new funding opportunities to share them back with us so that they can be published through this uh, database. And we're currently working uh, on uh, another database, this time for experts. Uh, this again, it's a request that came uh, from the stakeholders involved in the project to have a way to find uh, um, experts on different uh, um, areas related to value chain development and agriculture in and from the region. So uh, we are putting this, to get this together. Um, we are in the beta version. We have already some names that will uh, be um, added to the database. And of course, uh, we encourage other experts to um, join in and, and register themselves when the database will be available. The other component of the platform, together with the website, is uh, uh, this series of multi-stakeholder public-private producer groups. Uh, we're talking here about email-based uh, groups, um, and they we have about 12 uh, at the moment that have been set up uh, throughout uh, uh, the um, course of the project. And all in all, all together, these groups bring, uh, um, bring in more than 450 members um, from the region, but also be, so from the various countries in the Pacific region, but also beyond that. So it's about uh, 25, more than 25 countries that are represented. Um, uh, we have people from more than 25 countries registered through the various um, online groups. Uh, we say we talk about email based groups, but each group has also an online space. Um, we have one main group that brings together all these uh, uh, 450 plus uh, uh, members. Um, and then we have a series of uh, uh, country based group for each of the country that it's been participating in uh, um, this project. Um, we have also um, several thematic groups. Uh, uh, you might be familiar with the capacity group, which has been used quite intensively lately as a support tool uh, for uh, the OPPO training. Most of you might have been participating in this uh, initiative as well. What are the groups uh, uh, used? What the, can the groups be used for and what are the features of these groups? Uh, first and most important, groups can be used for discussion. We said it's email-based groups, so all the content is circulated via email and members can participate, read and reply from the mailbox. But each group has also uh, the archive, brings together the archive of this discussions. So, so the emails that are circulated are all available into an online archive. This is very useful for uh, reference uh, to go back to previous conversations. Maybe you have new people coming on board uh, in your group. You can point them to previous discussions through the online archive. Um, for participants that have been uh, uh, participating in the PWA last uh, September, October in, uh, in Samoa, uh, we use the discussion functionality quite intensively to run uh, um, an online thematic conversation, e-discussion, ahead of the workshop. Um, so that allowed us to um, get to know each other a bit better and finding uh, what were the issues at stake and to prepare um, the the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, meeting. The groups also allows us to, or the groups also bring together the profile of the members. So uh, you have a bit of uh, uh, who is who, 
um, that can be useful to browse to identify the various actors at the national as well as at the regional level. Another uh, useful functionality of the online groups, uh, well, I think we think it's useful, it's the possibility to share files and folders. Um, so to create a library of useful documents. Again, participants that were at PWA in this year in Samoa, uh, so uh, how we use this in practice, we at the end of each day, we were uploading presentations, slides, and materials used during the workshop and then making them available um, at the same time to the participants. So it could was very easy to bring them together and to access them. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, the groups uh, allow have a calendar functionality, um, which could be very useful to uh, create shared calendars of events, uh, meetings, uh, uh, initiatives that are relevant for the stakeholders um, and uh, for the various countries and in the region. So the online platform and the groups uh, that we just see uh, are not just sitting in a vacuum. They just don't. Uh, they're not standing alone, but they're really an integral, integral part and a key component of the project promoting nutritious food system in the Pacific Island. So one of the goal of the project uh, is to strengthen the capacity of Pacific Island governments, farmers, private sector organizations, and sub-regional institutions to develop strategies and programs, as well as mobilizing financing that can increase uh, uh, poor, poor rural people access to nutritious health and healthy food. So the platform, it's really a support tool to enable this project, uh, this objective. And uh, uh, we quickly zoom in more on to this. Uh, I'll just hand over to Jana briefly, so she will just uh, tell us a bit more how the platform fits into this uh, uh, overview, this this larger uh, project approach. Jana, thank you, thank you, Pierre, and good evening, everyone. Jana here uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for joining. And just quickly on that uh, policy process and uh, how we uh, brought the capacity building component together. Uh, to develop strategies and programs. So how we have gone about it is um, we have started a process uh, that um, had identified four key areas. So there were key studies done in each of the seven target countries. And um, out of that, there were areas identified that are crucial in um, uh, increasing access to nutritious food. So these are nutrition, finance, weather risk, and ICTs. And in May 2018, a regional forum in Fiji was organized with more than 150 participants from the, uh, and these are multi-stakeholders from the seven countries came together and they established a national and regional action plans. Then after that, um, the training of key facilitators for each country has started to further validate those plans in country. And uh, in uh, December, the first country validation workshop was held in Tonga. And after for the other countries, face-to-face uh, -face and then online uh, meetings uh, were held or the VCCAI platform was used to the online groups to further communicate on this but that will be explained in the interview with Joanna and then last October uh, we got together in during the Pacific Week of Agriculture in Samoa where we shared the learnings from this activity and also, um, multi-stakeholder ministerial communique was submitted. And after that, the government of Samoa strongly endorsed it and also their national action plan. So this is just to outline the, the policy process. And uh, now on going onwards, the validation workshops still continue. 
so like I said, uh, the first, the four um, action plans were discussed and shared, and uh, it was agreed on the priorities. Then the priorities were further defined in countries, and it was looked at timelines and budgets, and uh, this automatically led to a roadmap, so how to mainstream this in policy and programs. So national working and steering committees are essential to steer this progress further. And these are consisting of several actors from the private sector, from the government and also community organizations. So if we can bring everyone together and get everyone in an inclusive way to endorse this plan, uh, then we can truly say that this is a um, a multi-stakeholder process, but uh, also Jenna will talk more about this. And uh, then in the end, the progress that has been made since the first workshop uh, is being reviewed and then it, it is up to the government to get the final endorsement and integrate it into their national policy planning. So that is it just on the background of the whole policy process and how the platform has supported this. Uh, you will hear more about it now. So thank you. I would give back to. Thank you very much, Jana. This is very useful to bring uh, everything into context. And so this is all great. Uh, but now let's see how did things work in practice. So we're very happy to have uh, uh, today with us Joanna, Joanna Borg, uh, who I'm sure some of you know already, you might have already met. So Joanna is a national facilitator for Tonga and uh, she's also an uh, OPPO alumni. Um, she currently runs an agency that specializes in marketing, communication and branding and publication. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, she's a, a Kiwi-born Tongan who apparently, well, that's what uh, she told me, she went to Tonga in 2012 for an holiday and she has not left since. So I think this is already a great and interesting story in itself. Uh, but uh, um, here we want to know a bit more about her professional experience. Uh, John has worked uh, um, a lot in the international, um, internationally across a broad range of industries uh, uh, such as tourism, hospitality, telecommunication. Um, but most of all, Joan is very passionate about advancing Tonga and its people by sharing her international experience for development. So today, Joanna will tell and will share with us the experience of the validation of the Tonga National Action Plan using online tools to support face-to-face -face workshop and collaboration. So if you have any questions uh, as the interviews um, progress, I see that Agnes has just joined us. So if you have any questions uh, while we go through the interview, please log them in into the chat and we will we'll refer to them. We will go back to them during the Q&A. Could be questions, could be comments, could be ideas that you'd like to share. So without any further ado, let me, let me welcome Joanna with a warm round of virtual applause. Uh, Joanna, thanks very much, very much for, for making, making time, time and for, for being, being with us with today. Us today. I'm muting you uh, because we have a bit of an echo, so I'm going to unmute you when I'm, uh, I mean, you'll unmute yourself after you hear my question, otherwise we'll have a bit of uh, um, echo. Um, yeah, technology, you know, sometimes um, give us problems. So, John, let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you get involved into this project as Tonga National Facilitator? Thank you, Pierre. Um, I got involved as a result of sitting in as part of the validation workshop that was held last year in December in Tonga. There was a learning journey that CTA had put together and we had all seven countries and some representatives attend um, this learning journey in Tonga. And I sat um, in the Tonga team when they were looking at the plan and looking at the priorities that were a part of the plan. Um, and as a result, because I was the youngest um, and probably the most the new person on the block, they asked me to take notes. 
that I took notes and then I had to email everybody um, all the notes that had been taken and had incorporated the changes or the notes that had been taken into the plan and then sent it around everyone via email to ask for them for their approval and whether or not they were happy with it. As a result of that, um, I was then um, communicating or directly with CTA and I think it was just a natural progression for me to then take on the national facilitator role. Thanks, Joanna. Don't, uh, uh, don't forget to mute yourself after you are done so I can then um, um, come in to avoid, to avoid the echo. But this is quite interesting, so it's, quite, uh, um, it's, it's basically being at the right place in the right, uh, at the right time. And yeah, quite interesting to uh, uh, journey already moving from taking notes to be a uh, national facilitator. Um, that's, that's impressive, actually. Uh, so when uh, uh, the opportunity came up uh, uh, I, and you started discussing with CTA what the role of the national facilitator would be and what was expected from you, uh, what was your first reaction? And in particular, uh, did you, could you already see uh, an immediate challenge that you could think about uh, uh, in uh, undertaking this, uh, this role? My first reaction uh, when the opportunity arose was, why me? Um, basically because, yes, I, I'm Tongan. I don't speak Tongan, and I saw that as being um, a hurdle. Because even though people in the private and public sector do speak English, they prefer to converse and discuss issues in Tongan because that is what they're comfortable discussing. That is a disability for me. But I thought, given that I was passionate about the project and given that my background with um, doing the OPPO training in the Netherlands, I was passionate and I thought, you know, I had the energy and I went, bugger the disability and the fact that I can't speak Tongan, I'm going to get over that and actually put the priorities that are in the action plan as a priority and not my inability to speak Tongan. Also, um, another challenge for me was I haven't been in the agricultural space for as long as a lot of the people that are currently working in agriculture and fisheries in Tonga. People that work in ministry have been in ministry for a long time, and they do find it hard, um, not hard, they do make it difficult for new players or new kids on the block. So that was my fear. But I thought, hell, why not? I'm going to do it and I'm going to get um, across this hurdle and um, and work together with, with public and private enterprise to actually get um, these issues at the forefront of the work that they're actually doing. Thanks, Joanna. Quite quite humble, I would say. Uh, you sound really, really humble. But and yeah, I understand. Uh, so uh, clearly, language was an issue. Uh, I would be curious to 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 know if in the process you also learn some more Tongan. I'm sure probably you did. Uh, and uh, uh, just a quick follow up here. I mean, uh, you you said you were the new kid on the block, and and uh, uh, you know the. The, the, the context, it's a bit, if you want, protectionist, right, in, in terms of getting, letting new players in. But isn't that also maybe, a, 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 a no, probably that also turned out to be an opportunity in the sense that you add less, uh, um, how do you say, a previous, probably a less biased vision, I would say, of things. Uh, um, is, that, is that a fair um, assumption? No, that's a, a, a totally fair assumption and a good assumption because that was what was driving me is the fact that, hey, I am the new kid on the block. I don't have all that um, luggage from the past or history that I'm carrying with me forward into the relationship. So I've come in with fresh eyes and a fresh new perspective to look at the same um, uh, priorities 
that are currently being worked on. So yes, totally um, worked in my favour and I saw it definitely as an opportunity. And for them to, to hear from someone new and fresh, that was what was driving me, as opposed to being someone that they're, they're used to seeing and hearing. Um, yeah, that, that was a huge um, positive and an advantage for me um, in doing this work. That's great. Thanks, Joanna. Let's, uh, uh, let's move on. So, yeah, you already said something about uh, the context in which uh, you operated. So, uh, uh, language, uh, um, cultural uh, elements, uh, um, it seems a quite consolidated context, uh, consolidated players, uh, probably a small context in which everybody knows each other, I, I would assume, uh, but maybe something, can we zoom in a bit, something more in terms of uh, um, where pe how, how were people already connected? I mean, people in terms of the stakeholders that you had to, um, that were involved uh, in this process. So were already, uh, was there already some sort of uh, uh, um, multi-stakeholder coalition or group in place? And if so, how were they uh, working together, communicating and collaborating? It, was there something or did you have to start from, from scratch in a way? I definitely didn't have to start from scratch and actually there were already some established groups and some established sort of stakeholder groups and steering groups that were um, in place already, especially in agriculture, there's an exporters group, um, there's also a group that work together that they call it the WASH um, group, um, which looks at water um, and sanitation health and also um, food security so there are already or there were already a number of groups working together um that were looking at these priorities um but the way in which for me the way in which they were looking at the priorities was a little bit different and because they're looking and dealing and speaking about these same priorities over and over again um i think i think the right word to use here is that they got stale and they kind of um, lose track of what they're actually supposed to achieve. So, um, uh, yes, no, it's not nothing new. There are groups and they're used to working collaboratively. Um, but what was missing is someone who actually sits outside of those groups and says, OK, what are we working towards? What is your objective? What are your clear plans? And um, what are you going to achieve in the next three months, six months, 12 months? They get together, but I think it was more of a, a social get together and um, and talking about the same issues over and over again with no clear outcome or there were outputs, but no outcomes, um, I don't believe. I'd like to pick up the follow-up question from Jana uh, that she just write, wrote in the chat. So, if this mix were, read, were really, if this group were really mixed in terms of public-private, uh, but also, so yeah, it's clear that they were already doing things. Uh, probably there was uh, an issue of lack of coordination between them and and creating synergies, uh, as I understand from, if I understand correctly, what you said. So. Uh, Yes, how were this group in terms of formation, where they mixed public private, and uh, you said you just said it was more of a social gathering uh, type of uh, uh, collaboration. So, uh, I, I were they doing anything online, or was just about uh, meeting every now and then to discuss priorities um, without actually then, like you said, without really achieving any outcomes afterwards and and the, this element of line collaboration was it uh, was it there somehow already or, or not sorry that's more than one follow-up question it's actually probably three follow-ups thanks Pierre um, okay should I answer the questions as they come I'll answer Jana's question about whether the groups are mixed is it public private yes the groups were mixed there was a good mix of public and private um, it almost felt like the group was set up or initiated by a private sector member and that if they needed um, or they wanted their views um, or um, to be made uh, or taken seriously, then they then 
had to make sure that someone from the government sat in, within their group. And not only was it someone at government, but also making sure that it was someone senior that had direct links to influencing policy. Um, so you'll find that on those groups, there was either a senior manager or CEO that was sitting on that group. And also, um, I, I cannot stress the importance of having nobility or royalty sitting um, on these steering groups or these advisory, advisory groups, because the nobles own the land in Tonga. And when it comes to agriculture, or actually everything, if you have a noble sitting within that group, that voice is actually considered um, a very powerful and very strong voice, because if you cannot get through the CEO, the noble will definitely have a direct link to government, um, and will be able to be a voice for you. Um, the second question about online, um, look, a lot of those groups will use email to uh, pass information or get answers very quickly from one another. Um, so email is a strong um, way of communicating within the group. They are also using WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is a, is a very popular group that they use, as well as um, messenger groups. So they do have Facebook groups that they use to communicate with each other. And sorry, I can't remember the third question now. If you can remind me, please, Pierre. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't written it down as I was speaking. So uh, let's see if it comes back, uh, uh, if it comes back uh, um, later on. Uh, but this is very interesting. So yeah, there are clearly some, again, cultural elements uh, uh, in the formation of groups and uh, that need to be taken in consideration for uh, successful outcomes um, and yeah let's and it's it's start to emerge what uh, the technology uh, the technology element so uh, online and uh, and uh, um, some some messengers messaging uh, uh, so chat and 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 Facebook Messenger. Um, we'll zoom in a bit later into the into the tools. Uh, um, and uh, uh, but so, can you just uh, briefly describe or provide a quick summary of the process you followed in terms of organizing the validation workshop, the first and the second one, and introducing the online platform uh, um, as a support tool. So. What did you do? When did you brought in uh, the platform? How did you introduce it? What was the? Um, how did you frame it? Uh, what was the selling point, if there was any? Um, for Tonga, um, I did introduce the D groups to them right at the beginning, from the outset, um, when I had been appointed the national facilitator. But I noticed that people just didn't see the value of going onto the platform. And we can't use the excuse of not having um, internet connection or ability to access the internet. Because for Tongas, um, as an example, after our second validation workshop, we had engagement straight away on the, on the um, platform. How did I get them involved? Basically, at the second workshop or the second validation workshop, the facilitation methods that were used the groups and the, and the attendees, the participants, could see the value in working together and actually sharing information about what each uh, each organisation, private sector or public sector are doing. And what is missing is, outside of your normal media, people within um, aren't sharing information amongst themselves. So they were very hungry to see what other organizations are doing to address the four priorities that were in the Tonga Action Plan. So Tonga uh, are very tech savvy um, and they're very uh, active on social media, especially in Facebook and Instagram. So I had framed the D group around um, it being another social media, another Facebook, for people to engage on um, with regards to the different priorities that are in the action plan and how they relate to 
the work um, and their, their own internal organisational plans and that they could use the D group as a sounding board as well as a place where they can go and get advice on how to address things or how to put together projects projects or initiatives. So I, I, I kind of put it around like it's an online community similar to Facebook, similar to Instagram, similar to WhatsApp. Um, and had I had done that at the first validation workshop, I probably would have got engagement a lot earlier than I, than I did now. That's very interesting. So I think uh, if I understand you correctly, it's both the packaging, how do you present it? So as a social network, so it's something that it's close to them, to what they were already using. But I think the other element that it's interesting to me, it's when you said uh, it's a place where you can ask for advice, uh, where you can, that, that can work as a sounding board. So I think it's, it's both the packaging, but also the message that, that you, um, that you use that's uh, for me for me it's very very interesting uh, so not just uh, yeah that's uh, that's what you use because uh, but it's this is really where you can get help so I think that's very interesting way to uh, uh, to to frame it. Um, it let's move a bit on on this uh, on this topic um, and uh, you already mentioned some of the of the obstacles and uh, uh, how you change your um, your strategy if you want uh, between the first and the second workshop uh, you say the connection is not an issue uh, is there any other obstacles or challenge that you had to overcome in the in introducing um, users or members of the uh, nation of the Tonga group uh, in uh, to the online platform any other things that you haven't mentioned yet I think, um, one of the main selling points for getting the engagement on this platform was letting um, the participants know that there's no right or wrong and there's nothing wrong with any of the questions or any information that you're asking of the platform or asking of the group or the people or the participants that are on the platform. Um, because often there's this element that if you're asking a question or you're sharing something, um, you either don't know or you're being, um, you're showing off. So I wanted to put the participants at ease that there's none of that. Um, we're not... Um, we're not encouraging that kind of behaviour, we're actually encouraging learning and open lines of communication and collaboration and that everyone has something to share um, that is of value to everybody. And if it isn't of value to you, then you need to show some respect and just let that information stay within the chat group because we can always go back to it and, and, and it may help us not straight away, but it could help us somewhere down the track. And also um, making it about relationships because people do, especially um, everyone works in their own little worlds. Farmers are out on their farms during the day and the only time that they're engaging on the platform is either early in the morning or really late at night um, where with government um, departments and ministries, they're online during the day. So they're, you know, it's, you need to encourage that kind of behavior and respect um, within the group. This is really interesting. So it's about relation, you just said, uh, about trust, uh, learning, open collaboration. And I just want to pick up on what you, uh, one of the last points you made in terms of uh, um, engaging different voices. And that also relates to what Tiana is asking in the chat. Um, so what about uh, the voices of the farmers, small, uh, uh, medium enterprises, community organization? Um, they were part of the process. Uh, uh, was, it, was it for them an opportunity to to uh, to have more voice, if you will, the process in general, but also the the use of this uh, uh, of the online group. Did you see any um, particular behavior in that, uh, or anything that uh, um, it's worth sharing when it comes, especially to the participation of these actors? 
Yeah, look, um, there are a couple of farmer organisations um, who were uh, participating in the in the workshops and also in the um, communication. For example, the Livestock um, Council, which is a, a newly established body, they've only been in operation since the beginning of the year, and offline, um, the the CEO or the the leader of that group says that they have just been finding it hard to work with across other public sectors um, like fisheries and just tourism and, and anyone outside of agriculture. And the only champions for them were Ministry of Agriculture. So they really saw this as um, a community where they felt that they actually had a voice and that they could actually add value as well as um, collaborate and be introduced to people that they were finding hard to create relationships with. So definitely for them, for the smaller organized, small SMEs, they really saw this as being valuable and as a way of getting in without having to go through the normal sort of um, initiation phases that you go through when you're establishing relationships with government ministries or other established groups such as the ex exporters group or the health promotion groups that um, involve private and public sector organisations. So, yeah, does that answer that? Yeah, I think so. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think yeah, the keyword is really a relationship and and yeah, a opportunity to 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 jumpstart and 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 springboard some um, connections that were not there before. Um, now let's. Uh, uh, in this process, uh, well, you said before you didn't speak Tongan. You are new on the block, a new kid on the block. Um, uh, you had to get into uh, a new territory in a way. Um, were there any? Who were your who were your allies and champions? Uh, who did you um, ask for help, if any, or? If not, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's great. But did did you did you find any key actors that you could mobilize to uh, bring on board that you had to mobilize first and bring on board? So again, allies and champions. Definitely, I needed allies and champions to be able to get this work done as the new kid on the block. Um, I had because I do a lot of work with Nishi Trading. Um, I'm a consultant to them. Um, so automatically, they were one of my um, champions who made sure um, outside of this whole process, they were all, they were always advocating for the work that I was doing and making it easy for me to be introduced into different gov government ministries, even though through some of the other work that I'm doing, I had already had um, established relationships. But for this particular work, having a champion like Nishi Trading, who is a private sector um, business, as well as being a vocal um, voice um, at the policy table when it comes to agriculture and health. It was great to have them on board um, vouch for me and advocate for me, as well as validate the work that I was doing. In addition to that, on the ministry side, um, through the other work I was doing, I had a relationship with the Ministry of Health and Tonga Health, so it was great to work with them. But most importantly for me, um, Agriculture um, this year, or the Ministry of Agriculture this year, has been has been a bit topsy turvy because they have had some change at the top with their CEO and their um, minister. So I went straight to the Minister for Agriculture um, and spoke to Honourable um, the Honourable Minister at the time, who was Losaline Maasi, and she became a great ally and a champion for the work that I was doing, not only for the National Action Plan, but also some of the other work that I was doing, because she could see that there was a direct relationship with the work that I was doing, and that I did come to the table with a fresh perspective at um, how we could collaborate better um, both at uh, community level, um, uh, private business level, as well as government level. So, so, so important to have key people who have a voice, who are already at the policy table, being my ally and um, champions for this work to continue. 
and where this also your allies and champions when it comes to the use of online of the online platforms or uh, did you have other people that uh, in the group that uh, jumped on immediately and maybe were more active online um, you know they took they took the lead online in terms of uh, uh, asking questions providing answers sharing uh, information um, so looking specifically at the at the online collaboration and communication were the same allies or you had different well champions and allies or you had Uh, with the online, uh, I suppose so. The, the minister was engaging online as well, not so much um, Nishi trading. Uh, but after that second validation workshop, or at the second validation workshop, where I stressed the importance of using the D group to communicate <laughs> with each other, outside of having face-to-face -face meetings, which we, which I had stressed, does take a lot of time to bring together, and also having to explain or seek um, approval from your ministry or your business to be away for a whole day to discuss issues um, that are part of the action plan is a lot harder. So I was really getting across the importance of using um, the D group. So everyone really was a champion. All it took really was for one person to engage and then it just meant that everyone else started to engage as well so I, I mean with regards to the online platform everyone that was engaging on it um, were were champions because when you saw the engagement it almost made it okay for other participants to get on and actually communicate and engage with the platform so it's more like this copycat behavior if I see one person doing it oh, it's okay, I can go on and I can engage in it. So that's when you create that 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 um, atmosphere that it's okay, um, everyone else jumps on. Yeah, so it's about having, setting the right space and then it just take one person um, to, to break the ice, probably. Uh, so can we look uh, now uh, at, you know some specific use that you're making on the platform. You mentioned before information. Well, uh, clearly getting feedback on the national uh, action plan, sharing information. Um, is there anything else? Is there any specific uh, uh, other uh, other specific activities that you're using the platform for, and what does it help you achieving? I did share um, on the. Uh... Last month, uh, the Ministry of Health had uh, launched a new school's food policy, which did was mentioned and talked about um, during our validation workshop that Ministry of Education needs to work more closely with people like the Ministry of Health, Tonga Health, the My Nima Committee, when they're putting together these sorts of policies. And that policy that came out was a result of collaborative work. And um, when uh, Dr. Tukia was at the workshop talking about how she found it hard to work with other ministries, she was able to work with the right people in the workshop as well as outside of the workshop to be able to get this policy across. And it just made it easier for her. So, I just shared um, the work and, and the the launch of the school foods policy on the platform just to show people that it was a result of collabor a collaborative effort that managed to get this policy across. So I do want to use the platform a lot more to share examples of collaborative work that is being done in Tonga. Um, and I think the more we engage people, the more they'll be able to contact one another and say, hey, look, I want to have your advice or I want you to be part of the steering group or I want you to be part of the peer review group for it's some of the work that we're doing. Um, so that's, that's how we're using it at the moment. And then also I want to, or we should be... Um, I haven't seen enough of it, but I just I need to always kickstart the conversations on the on the platform to ask people about how they're doing and if whether or not there is any good news that they want to share with us. A bit like Facebook.
Thanks, Joanna. This is, I mean, you started to address already what's next. Um, so I think this is really, I mean, the examples you made, it's great of collaborative, outcome of collaborative effort that's uh, uh, initiated through this this group and then sharing them back. Um, any, other, any other use that you can think of uh, on top of what you just said? Um, informal sharing, bringing back, uh, um, is it some other other activities that you can think the platform could be uh, useful for? And aside from you know the collaborative um, efforts on on talking about policies or getting advice from the participants, I really think for Tonga's case um, that we need to use it more like a like a social platform and just get people engaged on it. So if we can share. I want to get people to share whatever it is that they're doing within their ministries or their businesses, um, whether it relates to the, the the priorities or not. I just I think people can just share the work that they're doing um, to inform us of you know what they're all doing. But yeah, and sharing documents or reports um, that are being done in each of their different organisations. That's where the, how the platform can be used. Um, because it is email based, um, and what's great is when you do when someone does post something on the D group, you get a notification in the form of an email, and um, yeah, you can't miss it. Yeah, we we'll, we we'll all live in our mailboxes, right? So um, yeah, I I understand you cannot you cannot miss that. While well, you can miss a notification on Facebook or uh, other things, the email you see it you see it just there. You open and uh, and, and you read through. I, I'm conscious we're running uh, uh, a bit late. Uh, I just have a couple of uh, uh, final questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, the first one, uh, I'd like to zoom a bit out of the. Tonga um, experience and the great uh, um, story that you just uh, uh, shared with us. And so if we look a bit uh, at the broader context of the Pacific, how do you see online collaboration developing in the region? Um, I'm particularly interested in that uh, uh, also in light of what was uh, discussed at PWA early this year. There was, uh, you know, some Keywords that kept coming out, or some some uh, threads that kept coming out, was the need to uh, have more and better communication, uh, collaboration across region. Uh, so, how do you see this happening from from your point of view and and your perspective, especially when it comes uh, when uh, when it comes about digital digital tools? I'm a great example for the use of digital tools and um, online collaboration because um, I'm calling you uh, or I'm talking to you from New Zealand, even though a lot of the work that I do is based in Tonga. So the online collaboration tools means that we can communicate and collaborate with people and not be in a room with those people. Um, and you don't need to, you know, you, you don't have to have the like a, a getting together a planning day where you've got an opening prayer and then you've got photographs and then you then you have the structured program. You can do away with that and have and encourage these open lines of communication without the formalities and actually get to the point and actually steer people to have an outcome a lot quicker than having um, a day, you know, a one day or two day face to face planning. The collaboration, it just makes it easier and people can collaborate in real time without having to see each other. And if there is a need for you to see a face or talk to someone, you can do that by, you know, by having a video call. So I think this is the way of the future, especially for the Pacific. Everyone has access to the internet, might not be a great internet connection. But through the D group and having email um, notification when someone is uploaded a document or is asking for something um, is perfect. And it also removes those barriers. I think that's what I'm trying to get at is that it's removing those barriers that you get when you have a face to face meeting. Sometimes the right people aren't at those meetings because they're tied up in other businesses or, or other meetings or they're being stretched 
So the people who need to make decisions can actually be um, on the platform and make a decision or pass comment or give advice straight away without having to wait for a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm nodding here. You cannot see me, but I'm I'm nodding a lot. Uh, I really um, I really like uh, uh, how you're framing uh, uh, this this point. Uh, the the open line of communication, open collaboration, um, getting the right people uh, participating from from wherever they are, uh, reducing the the. The, the element of formality and just uh, um, yeah getting down to, uh, to to business in fact to do things um, uh, maybe and yeah I, I think I still believe face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, um, as an element as a role but probably it's it, it's more in terms of Getting to know people, building a building a bit of trust and relation, because we know if you meet face to face, then it's probably easier to com to communicate and collaborate online, right? So uh, there is probably th th there is still a value in that, uh, but yeah, I I again I'm nodding a lot in terms of of uh, um, opening up opportunities, more opportunities. Um, uh, I would like to conclude uh, probably just taking uh, the last uh, question that Jana has asked in the chat uh, and we have that as our final question and then we wrap up. So what are the next steps for policy uptake of the National Action Plan in Tonga? In Tonga's uh, case all the participants are aware of the priorities that are in the National Action Plan. And they are also um, have been tasked with how do they make sure that these priorities are, are a part of their own internal strategic plans. And for um, health and agriculture and fisheries, it's timely because they're actually working their current um, agricultural plan, health promotion plan, and fisheries plan is actually up for renewal from June. Is well, their current plan ends on the thirtieth of June, twenty twenty. So they're currently in the stages of coming up with a new plan or looking at ways of amending their current plans to include these priorities. Now, there's no um, doubt, or there's no for all government sectors, the, the priority around healthy eating and food security is definitely there. What is missing is um, ensuring that there isn't duplication of tasks and duplication of efforts. So they know that if there is to be a policy um, or an act activity or an action plan, that, that it needs to be mirrored in the other ministries, government ministries, as well as come down to private sector. So um, the next part for Tonga is to possibly look at a, another meeting in sort of February, March to see if whether or not people are coming together and actually collaborating and talking to one another about how they may allow these priorities to fit into their action plans. Another example or another thing, another point that did come out of the um, workshop was around insurance um, because everyone, health and finance are already priorities, but around insurance and ICT, ICT is, is now part of most ministry plans, but we need to help private sector with with um, the engagement in ICT. But insurance is, is, is something that people bury and don't want to have anything to do with, purely because they don't understand how insurance works and how it can add value to their businesses. So um, I have spoken to uh, Ministry of Finance and National Planning, as well as um, Ministry of Economic um, and Trade Development, to see how they can put insurance um, on um, an agenda not only for business people, but also for um, the private sector on getting um, or just educating people on insurance. So we need to come across, um, we need to get together and just in, 
um, encourage the collaboration with people working on their national um, strategic plans for the next five years. I could go on and on. Um, one more question. What would the advice be that you'd give to others in a similar role than you? Um, the advice that I would give is don't give up. Keep talking. It's really important that you have face-to-face -face meetings with the key decision makers. And for me, I did take time out to actually go out, sit in offices and wait for the minister or the CEO to actually turn up and make sure that you have a champion in that ministry or in that farming organization that can sit with you and understands exactly the work that is being done and the action plan. So for example, from the Ministry of Agriculture, I had uh, Metui Falesiva, who was a great ally for me when I was going in to see both the CEO and the Minister of um, Agriculture to make sure that they were supporting the plan. So get an ally, get a champion, and um, make sure that those allies and champions are aware of all the work and the action plan and what is required and have them accompany you to all your meetings so that you can or get have them on board when you need them so that you've got that support um, to enable you to do this work. Thanks, Joanna. This is this is really really great, uh, and yeah, I'm really happy that uh, um, we could have you with us sharing sharing your experience. And yeah, I I could stay and listen to you for you know much longer than uh, than the time we have we have available. Um, so hopefully, yeah, we could uh, uh, continue this conversation um, and you know uh, get get more out of your experience uh, um, in in other. Uh, webinars or in other in other presentations, uh, but I think yeah we used uh, much more than the time we had booked you for. Um, so I think we can uh, un unless there is any final comments for from Yana, um, I think we can probably uh, stop here. And uh, I'm gonna just uh, well, again thanks a lot uh, for for your time and. Uh, your um, collaboration in this. This is really, really interesting um, case to hear from. Any final word, Joanna, from you? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pierre and Jana, for giving me the opportunity to share the Tonga story um, with other national facilitators and other interested parties. It's a great um, initiative, and it's great if you can get through. Don't give up, because um, there are times when you think you want to give up, but uh, keep soldiering on. It's all for the sake of developing um, our countries and our economies and um, and. The, the livelihoods of our people. Malo Alpito and uh, Ofatu.